And if you read the Declaration of North America, which was signed by Joe Biden, uh, Obrador, the president of Mexico, and Trudeau out of Canada, that Declaration of North America signed in January of 2023 talks about uh, the fact that they are you know, supporting migration into the region that used that was formerly known as Canada, America, or the United States and Mexico. They have now regionalized us and taken our borders down by this document. Hello, everyone. Dr. Chris Martinson here with another Off the Cuff podcast for PeakProsperity.com. Wow, today is a huge, huge adventure. We're going to be talking with Ann Vandersteel, host of Right Now with Ann Vandersteel. I first met her for the first time in person when I was invited down to Panama by Michael Yan. And as you know, I was down there with Brett Weinstein and a group of other people. And it was very instructive, opened my eyes and allowed me to see very clearly what's going on for the first time. I'd heard about the immigration issues. And once I went to Panama and saw it firsthand, I understood it's not immigration, it's migration. Immigration is a careful vetting process, 70 boxes to check, multiple years, tests, investigations, where a country brings in thoughtfully somebody. Migration is when a species of animal moves from a low resource area to a high resource area. That's what we're experiencing. Maybe there's other things underlying that. We're going to get a deeper sense of that today with Anne. Anne, so good to have you on the program today. Chris, great to see you, and it was great to meet you in person, somebody I've admired from afar since the early days of uh, the COVID pandemic. So it was just uh, really an honor, and thank you so much for joining the Operation Burning Edge expedition to get acquainted with what is really happening down there in the Darien Gap, which is impacting our country right now, even as we talk. Absolutely. So I want to get your your uh, firsthand views of what, what settled for you after going down there, but Operation Burning Edge, what is it, and, and who's involved? Certainly. Michael Yan, a very uh, famed uh, war correspondent, former Green Beret, who has logged more hours behind enemy lines with a camera and been in more firefights than any other war correspondent that I'm aware of, uh, asked me to join him after we had met. I guess it was right after January 6th. We became acquainted with one another, stayed in contact. And he knew me as somebody that when he called, I would show up. And so he called me last summer and said, hey, I really want to do a border expedition going from Texas to California. Would you join me for the month of August? And I said, I'm in. So we rented an RV and uh, got a team of other folks together and started out in Texas under the name Operation Burning Edge, not an LLC, not a nonprofit, but just an idea concept to look at the burning edge of our country, which we clearly see is on fire with this massive weaponized human migration. So we wanted to get a handle on it from the U.S. side. Learned a lot. And Michael, who has been going down to Darien Gap in Panama since the election, excuse me, selection of Joe Biden, yep. uh, for those that you know see it that way, when Joe Biden was put into the office, he decided to head to Panama and take a look at the, immig- the migration that was happening down in the Darien Gap, which is that 60 uh, mile long strip of land between Colombia and Panama. And it's through very dangerous jungle and mountainous conditions. He realized early on that that was going to be the path that the United Nations and the globalist elite would actually use to move mass amounts of people into America. Because, again, the agenda is for the new world order to have a one world government. And frankly, they're not after America. They're not after even you and me, Chris. They're actually after the world. And as my good friend Mel Kay says, America is in the way. So that's really what Operation Burning Edge is about. We're looking at this weaponized mass human migration worldwide, the conditions that are being set by the globalist elite uh, by, you know, pulling on strings here, pushing a button there. And uh, it's all coming together. And it's unfortunate that the, the people around the world are, frankly, the victims in all of this. Yeah, and that's what I saw clearly firsthand, uh, you know, and thanks for the invite. It was so great to be brought down and to see for myself firsthand what was happening down there. But, you know, um, just to set the stage for anybody who doesn't know, um, you and I, we flew down there, we get picked up, drive four, four plus hours south of, of Panama airport in Panama city to where the road literally ends, uh, for yeah. the Pan American highway pretty much. And then a little dirt road down to a boat landing into a dugout canoe. And then four hours up a river with a 15 horse Evan Rude and, and, a you know, a local guide to get to one of these camps where, you know, you can see chicken on the grill and there's some Wi-Fi and there's a center front, which are the Panamanian border police. But what shocked me and was seeing all the different kinds of people coming out because it's how it had been presented to me was 
the, the poor, the hungry, the dispossessed, if you do see a picture in the New York Times, they'll show you like a mother carrying a child. I saw Venezuelans. I saw a few families, but we saw Chinese people, Afghanis, people from Ghana, Haitians. This was not what had been presented to me at all. And, and so that really was instructive to me. I was, this is an unthinkable border lapse and security lapse to me that you would be allowing the people I saw just in my brief time there to come in with open arms, unfettered, you know, into the country. And those are the ones they made walk. We can talk about the fact they flew them in directly, uh, maybe later. What did, what, what was that experience like for you? What did you see? Well, the first time I went down, Chris, um, I'd never been to uh, Panama on the ground. I'd gone through it in the canal, but n never really logged yeah. time in Panama. I was quite impressed with this with this country of Panama in Panama City. But when you get to the Darien Gap, it literally is the third world. As you said, the road ends, it's dirt roads. Uh, you need four-wheel drive to get around down there. And um, it, it's extremely um, remote. What I found tragic was understanding what had happened to the indigenous of Panama, the Embarra, the Kuna Indians that have mm. lived there in harmony with nature, to borrow a phrase from the great Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum. These Indians were brought there by Balboa 500 years ago when he left Colombia to explore Panama, and he needed help along the way. So these Indians were basically migrated back then, and they've since then lived beautifully along various river fronts. They're uh, an agrarian society. They grow, you know, they grow their own food. They have their own you know, cattle and horses and livestock, and, and they are self-sustaining for the most part. Uh, enter the United Nations and the plan to weaponize migration and move mass quantities of people. As we know, you know, these bankers' wars have forced migration all over the world, and we're seeing it happen in real time. In fact, right now, this period of history is arguably the biggest mass migration in world history, and it's all basically mm. manufactured mass migration. Uh, and what has happened is the United Nations and their funded NGOs, these non-governmental organizations like HIAS, like the American Red Cross, like UNHCR, like Doctors Without Borders, are down there uh, with maps and giving these migrants maps to show them the routes that they can get to America uh, through very dangerous conditions. But they're there under the pretense to help humanity, to help the, to these people that are coming through. But what they've done is they've supplanted themselves on top of these indigenous Indian reservations, taken over their entire way of life, their, their, their own reservations, and put up their own camps right on top of the Embarra, who are the indigenous. And if you read the Declaration of North America, which was signed by Joe Biden, uh, Obrador, the president of Mexico, and Trudeau out of Canada, that Declaration of North America signed in January of 2023 talks about uh, the fact that they are you know, supporting migration into the region that, used, that was formerly known as Canada, America, or the United States and Mexico. They have now regionalized us and taken our borders down by this document. They're talking about protecting the indigenous and providing sustainability and protecting the climate and the environment, when in fact everything that they say to protect uh, is, has been actually harmed by this entire operation of weaponized human migration. The environment in the Darien Gap is seeing trees cut down that have been there since Adam and Eve at an alarming rate. It's changing the ecosystem and the climate. They're in a massive drought right now. The Indians are seeing disease they've never seen before by mass migration of people they've never seen or been in contact with before. Um, the jobs of the Indians and to expand their own agrarian society has been replaced by, as you said, these dugout canoes known as paraguas, where they're basically moving the merchandise of human beings up and down these rivers to facilitate human trafficking. So everything that was organic to that region, including the UNESCO-protected Darien Gap, right, is seeing their indigenous species die off at an alarming rate. And it's, again, all manufactured by these same peoples who say they're here to, there to help humanity, putting up their tents, telling you they're there to facilitate the poor economic refugees and migrants which have been lured through this. And, in fact, half the time when we were there, more than half the time I documented it, Chris, people from highest, people from Doctors Without Borders were simply not there manning their tents. There was nobody there to help these people that have wandered through this jungle uh, and paying coyotes and cartels to give them safe passage when many of them are raped or robbed or killed or succumb to the environment like mudslides and, and other things. So it's, it's, it is the most um, obscene uh, misrepresentation of what is actually going on by the United Nations and their NGOs and, of course, the failing New York Times, which is the mouthpiece for the cartels. It's owned by Carlos Slim. 
It's just phenomenally uh, disturbing to me what, what I saw there, because uh, exactly as you describe, Ann, um, it, it, it's a scam. It, it's, it's some sort of a scheme, right? So they make these people walk through this 60 mile chunk of, of fairly dangerous jungle. They have to go up and over the continental divide, which is 4,000 yeah. feet, which it can actually get cold there, even though it's pretty far south uh, during certain times of the year. It's dangerous. They say they care about people, but they care so much that they go to the Colombian side and they hand out rape kits to women, young girls, because they know that they're probably going to get raped. So, and, and as I mentioned before, these are people sometimes from Afghanistan or, you know, from the Middle East or from Asia. They fly in and then they have to walk through this perilous journey. It's, it's what a kabuki theater, like why make them go through that perilous journey and then say, I'm doing this because I care about people. I want to harness the power of migration, as Amy Pope, the head of the IOM, says for UN. How do we make sense of that? The only way I can make sense of it, Chris, is that it's all about optics, right? Uh, the hit piece that came out from the New York Times today is using the optics that these are economic migrants and refugees that are coming to America for a better way of life. They're mischaracterizing the work that we're doing and showing who's really coming through. They didn't post any pictures of a bunch of military age men from the Chi from China or from Afghanistan or from Pakistan or anywhere else for that matter. They are just showing pictures of, of women and children, which yes, there are some. Uh, but again, to me, those are props and a lot of them are gonna be put into f forced labor from what we're learning on this side and what we've exposed on the American side with the NGOs here you know, the separation of the children um, and they're being, you know, housed in warehouses and then they're being, you know, it's been documented and exposed by the team at Muckraker, who's a phenomenal group of journalists showing that these mm -hmm. children are being sent off to other homes around the country that are being uh, lived in and housed by, uh, you know, illegal aliens that are basically black sites, if you will. These kids disappear because they're not tracked anymore. So this is about optics and it's about being able to launder billions and billions of dollars under the name of HIAS and the American Red Cross and UNHCR and Doctors Without Morals, as we've now called them. Let's be clear, Chris, the exposés that we have done down there and proving that with our own eyes and documented in videography that there were no people in those tents and calling into question the morality of handing out maps and rape kits as if that's part of the uh, entertainment experience when you go through the jungle. They lure you there and they go, here's a rape kit in case you get raped. I would be uh, turning around and leaving, but they continue to propagandize these people who, sadly enough, probably don't have a high IQ because they've just not been educated from where they're coming from, right? So it, it's just really, and they're promised, you're going to make a lot of money when you get to the U.S. The U.S. is going to give you everything. It's going to be a better life. Well, now you see New York City kicking migrants out, saying we're evicting you out of these uh, migrant hotels and camps up here. It's a lie from start to finish. But nobody in the mainstream media wants to talk about this because the mainstream media is going to weaponize this and use this as Joe Biden has a heart. When in fact, you know, I believe Joe Biden to be the largest trafficker of humans in the world today. He's the kingpin of it all. So it, this is about optics for all of them and how they can launder as much money as possible through their organizations. It's it's that uh, I I agree, but I I have to get back to this. I can't make sense of it. So that's the problem because I'm a like you. I'm I'm a normal human being. I can think in whole thoughts, and I actually have a heart and I care about people. Um, and so I I can't make this make sense because you say it's for optics, and I think they do it for abstractions and uh you know whatever they're up to and on the other side of this thing. But let's just take it. Yeah, you have something to say? Are you at, are you asking what the end game is here? Well, I, I'm just trying to make I'm just trying to like even make sense of their story as presented. So so let okay. let's carry this through. They're like, look, we care about these people. It's economic migrants, and I want to hear all about this hit piece in a second. So we care about these people because they're poor. Now, where do these people end up when they get into this country? I've checked. Um, I have I get I have uh, I assemble my key supporters once a month. And, and last night we were asking this question, I'm like, in your communities, are you seeing these people? And it was mixed bag. Chicago was seeing some of these people coming in. Portland had noted that there was a lot of migrants that just suddenly disappeared over the last week, week and a half. They don't know where they went. Right. So we're assembling this story, but they don't end up on Martha's Vineyard. They don't end up in Greenwich, Connecticut. In fact, they end up in poor communities where they are now competing for whatever resources, housing, jobs 
you know, um, donations, whatever those things are, they are now in competition with our own poor people. So they're basically, I'm just trying to make sense of their story. Hey, we care about poor people, just not our own poor people. Like, how do we begin to make sense of this? Well, I mean, if you look at the, there was a document put out by the UN in 20, tw uh, was it 2020? Sorry, 2000, I believe. I'm sorry, 2000. Uh, they actually talked about migration as a replacement population for the first world countries that were seeing their populations on decline. So this isn't something that's just, oh my gosh, we have economic migrants right now. This has been something that's been on the table for the United Nations and anybody connected to that organization for a, quite a long time. And the discussion of, you know, first world nations like, the, like America, like Europe, um, on, with populations on decline, in my humble opinion, is only exacerbated by the fact that we're, so ta we're taxed so heavily so mom and dad are both working and they can't afford to have more than one or two children. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it through that lens and that lens alone, this is, you know, making sense of it is this has been their agenda for quite some time. And they're using the fact that they've been able to decline our population because both parents are working. Um, and since both parents are working, children are farmed out to public education, which is a whole other topic we could go into. And that's mm -hmm. you know, changed attitudes and mindsets of the, of the youth growing up underneath us. Look at the Gen, Gen Zers, et cetera. Um, but if you look at it again through that lens, They've been planning this, and by putting out that propaganda early on as, well, we need to migrate people into first world countries because their populations are on decline and they won't have people to staff the jobs. That's the narrative that they're, that they're, that they're creating. But then you have to look at it through what has been the um, ec you know, economic policies of this president right now, Joe Biden. It's to, again, shut down energy independence, again, reverse yep. all the work that uh, President Trump did with executive orders to bring back manufacturing and the tax benefits and the individual tax deals he did and trade deals he did with countries all over the world individually, not en masse. Um, and it's now offshored our jobs again. So manufacturing has been shut down all over America again. And you factor in everything else. It's as if they're setting conditions with the with the food insecurity that we're going into in this country. And I know you've talked massively about it, so I'm not going to get into detail there. But the food, food insecurity in this country, and you start to add a lot of people that are dependent on the government for 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 money, Chris, and they're dependent um, on the government for housing and everything else. And you yank out the financial benefits that they're getting, and you yank out food, and Banking collapse imminent because we're seeing it individually. We can all attest to our Zells being limited, how much money we can transfer. We're already seeing the banks limiting our resources and access to. I think we're setting a table for a massive disaster that you're going to see. There's more people that are going to need access to food and money than there is going to be available food and money. And when that happens, people will resort to cannibalism to feed themselves. It gets crazy really fast. And you put a bunch of people in here by the Customs and Border Protection's own numbers, 47, excuse me, 46 million that they know about have come in this country illegally since 2021. By their own numbers, you add that sort of uh, stress to an economy uh, and they don't have food and money, what's going to happen to people that need to feed their families, whether they're here legally or not? It's going to create a condition of complete and utter chaos. And I believe it's going to make the George Floyd, Floyd riots look benign. So I, I do believe that is the end goal, but they're sort of using this cloak of we're here to help humanity and they're sending the conditions to scuttle humanity right here in America. So this is a, a, a tried and true rule of mine, which is whatever they say, they're actually doing the opposite of that, right? Bingo. So, right? They're trying to protect democracy. Oops, they're dismantling democracy. Um, Correct. On and on. So, so to add this up, we can see that we're on a, a, a fiscal train wreck. Government spend deficit spending over two trillion a year. We're headed. We're on a, We're on an unbroken track to fifty trillion dollars in debt. Nobody knows how that gets paid. We have drained our strategic petroleum reserve hamstringing the ability of more natural gas and, and uh, oil production here in the United States. Right. Uh, our food system's a mess. And now we're bringing tens of millions of people on top of that who basically are the kind of people who mostly need help. This isn't immigrants. They come in, they've got engineering degrees, whatever. We're right. talking people who are going to start at the bottom, going to need a lot of help. They're going to be more of a drain than an ad for a while uh, at best. And so we do all of that, the end game. And 
What is this the actually endgame, about? The end game is to literally destroy our constitution in America. And they're already showing the destruction of our constitution with the recent appeals court in Texas overturning the Supreme Court's decision to allow Texas to arrest illegals and deport. I mean, this is insane. The constitution, at the very least, if the federal government won't stand on Article 4, Section 4 and protect our borders, the states have rights under the 10th Amendment, but right in the Constitution under Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3, the states have the ability to also defend their borders. So the fact that the Texas even had to pass a, a law, SB 4, Senate Bill 4, to document that is absurd on its face. And the fact that it was, you know, argued up to the Supreme Court, which finally stood with Texas, and then to have the Fifth Circuit Court appeals appeal that and stop and put a stay to it. This is insanity. This shows you that there's zero regard for our Constitution, for we the people's common law, law of God, law of nature's rights to be here on and, and defend our country as as documented by our founding fathers 250 years ago. That is completely gone out the window and it's being subservient to the United Nations and of course the impending doom of the World Homicide Organization or the World Health Organization to pick your choice. Uh, when they, you know, hope, hopefully they don't you know, successfully pass, um, you know, the uh, pandemic treaty. But if they do, and of course all their amendments that they want, once again, all of our rights have been now subjugated to a Marxist called Tedros at the WHO, which is really the enforcement arm for the WHO. And they're going to use the, the health concern again and scare everybody. So this has been a well thought out plan, Chris, and this just didn't happen overnight. These maps and all the... Uh, all the uh, repetitive documentation you see all over the world, you know, push through the International Organization on Migration, IOM, which is the largest organizer for moving people around the world in this weaponized human migration. This just doesn't happen overnight because COVID. This COVID was the smokescreen to allow a lot of things to happen. And uh, this has been a plan in the works for a long time. This, quote, great, great reset has so much involved in it. It's a, it's a huge subject to unpack, and Operation Burning Edge is really focused on the weaponized migration piece of it, but it's hard not to incorporate all the other legs to this because they're all connected. They are all connected. So I see this as one of many attack vectors, but I, I want to get back to this, like the core of this, so we can understand what's happening. Sure. This feels like an intentional takedown mm -hmm. of the United States. And so, but they told us about this a long time ago. So the WEF, the Davos crowd, right in 2016, they released their famous little video, which said, you'll own nothing, but be happy. You'll, you won't eat as much meat. Da, da, da. But number eight was Western values will have been tested to the breaking point by 2030. And the first question is why Western values? Why not Chinese values? Why not Singaporean values? You know, why not African values? Why Western values? And then second, what are those Western values? Um, I don't know property rights, the right to define what happens in my own body, um, parental rights, uh, free speech. Every one of those things is under assault right now, and they are relentless. That's how I see it right now. What do you see? They're anti-God. Mm. I mean, let's, let's be clear. Our Constitution, our Declaration of Independence, invokes the word of our Creator four times. And they have done everything they can to undermine that. So I don't believe the Communist Chinese Party to be uh, worshiping God. They're atheists. They, they've declared that so themselves. So this is truly an anti-God agenda. When the World Economic Forum is pro-transhumanism, if God intended us to be uh, transhuman, in other words, incorporating you know, non-biological substances in our body to extend our lives, uh, he would have done that. But he didn't. He created man in his image around the world. We're all shapes and sizes and colors, and we live in different places, and it's fun to visit the culture all over the world because it's really cool to see how other people live and experience that. And if you really love it, you might migrate there. But for the most part, people love where they come from, and they want to go home because that's what they know. And sadly to say, this group of people, the globalist elite, which is, you know, Committee of 300, Council on Foreign Relations, the United Nations, the World Economic Forum... These are the anti-God people, and they've saddled up and cozied up right next to the CCP because it benefits them to both be in this together. And it benefits them, why? Because it gives them access using the CCP's One Belt, One Road initiative, right? The BRI, or call it Silk Road 2.0. And the Darien Gap is absolutely integral, and it's probably the most critical piece of real estate to them in the world because it has that east-west transit, but it, it involves... Um, 
moving a lot of people. And so, you know, when you look at the anti-God lens of this all, it's very clear why they all collaborate together. And it's very clear why they hate America, because our founding fathers created our documents of freedom to defend your God-given rights to free speech, to defend yourself, to be secure in your person's papers and things. They hate it all. And that's why I think that this has been such a vicious attack on America. Well, let's talk about part of that attack. What, let's... Um... New York Times, congratulations. By the time you, you've, you've secured a hit piece in the New York Times, you've uh, successfully flown over the target and got some flack. That means uh, that Operation Burning Edge has been successful in stirring up the hornet's nest a bit. So I consider that a good thing. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And, and um, uh, so tell us about that, that hit piece. What's what's in there? So essentially, there's a. It was. It's quite interesting how this all originated. Ken Benzinger is the journalist who focuses in on right wing journalists, as he calls. That's his. Uh, that's his beat, if you will. Showed up uh, unannounced in the Darien Gap, down at a camp. I think it was Lajas Blancas when we ran into him, which I believe you visited Lajas Blancas with us, and, and uh, I mm-hmm. recall him approaching me down on our last trip to Darien, introducing himself. I had spoken to him a year or two ago before on the phone. He wanted to do an interview, and to be frank, I don't even remember what it was about. I never looked to see if he actually wrote the piece, nor did I really care what he had to say, but um, because I just don't, I, I know where they're coming from. But he s- introduced himself and said he was there because he'd heard through Laura Loomer's prog- uh, broadcast when she was interviewing Michael Yan a few days earlier that they were going to be in the Darien Gap, so he wanted to come down and see what we were doing. I thought to myself, wow, that is quite incredible. The New York Times has a budget to send somebody down to Panama to come and track us down. We must really be over the target. Kudos. Now, remember, the New York Times is owned by Mexican telecom billionaire Carlos Slim, who, through my own investigation and many others, is connected to the cartels. He's quite the magnet and moves a lot of the chess pieces around down there in Mexico. Um, And so you could say the New York Times is another cartel propaganda, uh, you know, rag, if you will. But uh, we are actually affecting the cartel and their business by getting some of these NGOs shut down. So to have the New York Times come down there, follow Laura Loomer around, follow Michael Yan around, show up at our hotel and sit down and try and you know have breakfast with us when we in fact decided to interrogate him was quite effective on our side. But he was, he was really on a mission to, to try and paint us in as right-wing extremists pushing the fact that there were, you know, evil people coming through and overlooking the fact that there was economic migrants coming through the border. I never once said there aren't economic migrants, but it's by far, in my opinion, minuscule compared to what we see in terms of evil coming through the border. Doesn't matter if they're economic or not. The New York Times isn't going to report on the fact that this is having a detrimental impact on our country. And their entire hit piece was focused on Michael Yan, what Michael Yan has done in his past, um, don't talk about the fact that he is a, a famous Green Beret war correspondent who's, you know, effectively reported on the wars in the Middle East. They don't talk about the fact that Laura Loomer is a valedictorian from her class in college. They talk about the fact that she's a right-wing extremist. Michael Yan is, um, you know, pushing propaganda and dragging people down there and getting access where they weren't. And the reason they're not getting access, frankly, is because they don't publish the truth. And they're not going to get access if they don't continue to publish the truth. We don't pay anybody to be there, but it's very obvious the New York Times has actually paid uh, guides who pay taxes to cartels so that these guides can safely traverse the Darien Gap and get protection from the cartel as opposed to being robbed by the cartel. So there again you have a newspaper owned by Carlos Slim who's funding his own employees to pay people to pay the cartels to get them safely through to document the economic migrants coming through the Darien Gap. That's the story, and that's the truth. Uh, The other half of the most important story is that we're documenting the actual bad guys coming through that are now being, some of them being picked up on our side of the border. But again, CPB, 46 million people here, how many of them are bad God only knows, but we're going to find out in short order because it's, again, part of the plan. We're being warned about all sorts of things from cyber attacks and others that are going to happen in our country because, of course, Klaus Schwab says so. And so far, every time they have a table talk exercise, Chris, he's batting a thousand. It comes true. Now, I know that you can buy a congressman for disappointingly low numbers, like five figures or something, you know, right. ten, twelve thousand dollars and you get a vote, right? What we're talking about here is is when when we were there, I heard that from multiple different people who were traveling migrants coming through that it was three to five thousand dollars to make the journey. 
multiply three to 5,000 by a million, and that's three to 5 billion. So it's absolutely the case that there's a strong economic incentive for the people who are feasting off of that flow, feasting yeah. off of that human misery, taking the poorest people in the world, running them through this gauntlet and charging them thousands and thousands of dollars for that. And that includes a lot of cartel folks, right? So this is big business. I just want people to be aware. We're yeah. not talking about helping some destitute people and giving them the last half of our bagel. This is big business. And the New York Times was down there to try and protect that business. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. They're 100% trying to protect that business. Carlos Slim is the president of the New York Times. He's the owner. He's also very effective in running the cartels in Mexico. So if you're now threatening the cartel business and getting the Darien Gap potentially shut down, there's discussions right now where IOM may want to actually run a campaign saying the Darien Gap is not a route. Well, you know what I take that as? They're just going to use a different door. If you can't go through the front door, they're going to go through the window. And the cartels will always get you through the window. So when you start to threaten the cartel's business model and to the, to the figures you're talking about, Chris, excellent on the math, by the way, um, of, course, of course they're going to run a hit piece because they're hoping that we'll either be um, shut down uh, shamed by our government, who knows, but they're going to, you know, I, I consider that also, we should have our, we should be watching our backs because we are that effective. And it's not like we're a huge group of people either, but we're growing because more and more people are paying attention to this. Now, have you had any connections with anybody in, in um, the border patrol CBP who, who are like, I don't understand how they do their jobs. I don't understand how there mm -hmm. can't be dissension within the ranks, but it just came out where they, they, I uh, forget who, who reported it first, but the 320,000 people had been actually picked up in foreign airports, flown on CBP chartered flights directly into the United States. And then they had a FOIA request and the CBP came out and said, we don't want to tell you actually how many people we brought in or where we brought them to because that would compromise something, security or their internal embarrassment. I don't know what. Um, do you have do you have any contacts within that who are concerned or frustrated or angry about what they're being asked to do? Sure. Uh, I actually have a high level source inside inside Customs and Border Protection. I won't say where, but he does work on the border. And uh, yes, many of the board, mo majority of the Border Patrol are very unhappy with what they're being tasked to do. I don't know what their breaking point is before they finally say, I'm not going to follow an unlawful order. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to set aside their retirement and their income to do it. I don't know what the breaking point is. Perhaps maybe it's when there's a full blown war in our country, which I do believe is coming. And then we're going to see a civil war and it's going to be um, the few that are on the side of the economic, let me just use this in air quotes, economic migrants, they're invaders. Yep. The few that are on the side of the invasionary army that's being installed in our country um, and the invasionary army who are being given multiple different ways to get pathways to citizenship, including joining our military, including joining law enforcement. But, you know, local blue cities are finding other ways. New York is trying to work a circumvention to get these people, you know, at least the legality to work lawfully in the country or legally. I shouldn't say lawfully, legally, because there is a mm -hmm. difference. But I do think that that's coming. So uh, Border Protection is definitely upset about it. Uh, they've actually stood uh, they're with their backs to Mayorkas on a number of occasions when he's come to visit certain parts of the Bo Customs and Border Protection offices. So these people are not happy. But I don't see them yet, with the exception of leaking information, talking about how unhappy they are and, and this is what's really going on, um, I don't see them yet doing what they should be doing, which is defying unlawful orders. And, uh, you know, I have uh, I have kids in the military, and I've told them, no unlawful orders. And that includes taking any jabs that have, you know, experimental, you know, products in there or any R mRNA. You're not taking that stuff. Um, if even it costs you your job and they agree, they're not going to do it. So I, I, I really feel like this is a, a, we're at this point right now, Chris, where America has to do a seriously internal gut check and decide, yeah. do we want to just go along to get along and slide down this slope to communism? Think of it like this, right? You know, in the critical mass phase of, of where people are with understanding the reality and the truth of the situation, it was kind of like this, but now we're in a hockey stick trajectory. People are now awakening up really quickly to the truth. And then there are those that are just going to see that truth and where some are going, oh my God, they're going to go, I'm burying my head in the sand and the hockey stick is going to go in the reverse direction down. 
But I think that population subset is by far smaller than the population going up. And the reason I say that is because in the end of the day, when the banks do collapse, the only thing that's ever worked, it wasn't obviously, you know, poisoning kids with with pharmaceuticals or anything like that that were stopping anything from happening. It's all been about money. And this is how President Trump ran the country. It was all about money. He did trade deals individually with countries, right? Unilateral back and forth or bilateral trade deals. He didn't do mass deals. And I think if we see the banking collapse really start to impact people's way of life and ability to feed their families, that's when you're going to become a true conservative and you're going to go, wait, what did that, uh, what did that constitution say? Let me go to that page here. What, what should I be worried about and doing? What, where are my rights really rooted? And I think that's when people are going to wake up. So I hope the court border protection can come to that same conclusion because you know, they're useful idiots at this point. No disrespect to the good men and women there, but they're useful idiots just doing a job and they need to stop. They need to stop doing that yeah. job and do the job of protecting America. Yeah. And it, people do need to wake up because we have the legislative branch has been failing for a long time, passing these laws. We have the executive branch, which is just flailing around. We've got a senile president right now. I don't even, I don't even know who's running the White House. I asked this question to people and you get answers all over the map. Nobody knows who's actually in charge. But then the judiciary, my goodness, the decisions that have been coming out of the judiciary lately are just chaotic and and leading us to chaos. You just wrote about one I'm reading here from your uh, very excellent Twitter feed, X. I guess I can't bond with X. You wrote here, heartbreaking news. U.S. District Court Judge Sharon Coleman says illegals can own guns. It, Obama appointed her. I would have thought Obama appointed judges were against weapons, but not all of a sudden because it involves illegals. Yep. Help me make sense of this. How do you make sense of that? <laughs> How do you make sense of that except that it's an utter abomination of our constitution? It's it's an Obama nation of our constitution. I mean, it is literally it it, it it's unbelievable. It's truly unbelievable that they're extending the rights of a naturalized American to an illegal in this country. And you know, this is unfortunately uh, just to sh it just proves the point we talked about earlier. There is no constitution that is being upheld. It is in name only, and it is not being enforced, and it is not being uh, it's not being used even by the people. Here's what I have a real problem with right now, and I've been harping on this for years now. The people, you and me. We're all derelict in our duty to govern ourselves. We are the government. We just elect some people to go and execute what we want them to do. Well, we've supposedly elected a bunch of people, but what mm -hmm. we don't understand is that, you know, our constitution and our was subverted a long time ago with the apportionment act, right? Back in 1929, where they just, you know, basically said, you're only going to get 428 members of Congress. We're supposed to have one member for every 30,000 people. And thank goodness to an organization like tacticalcivics.com, they're actually one of their steps in their 19 step plan to restore America is to have um, the Bring Congress Home Act, which would include mm. increasing the number of representatives to one for every 50,000 Americans in this country. And so with that, we'll have well over 6,000 members of Congress. They'll all reside at home and we can actually interact. I digress on that because I want to make the point that we don't have a government at all that represents us. We have had everything basically stripped away from us, including, you know, installments of, you know, people in, in, in Congress, people in presidencies. And now you have these Supreme Court justices that are appointed by said people, but yet they're not really following even the Constitution. They do when it they can, but they have trap doors like we just talked about earlier, Texas. The Supreme Court stood with Texas. You got your state bill passed. Good job, Abbott and the Texas legislature. But, oh, the Fifth, Fifth Court of Appeals has now put a stay on it. So that's, that's what we call kayfabe. This is what Michael Yan uses, kayfabe. It's a fake fight. And the judiciary is working together to have a good guy and a bad guy and have a fake fight. So it looks like we're in this war of the Constitution. But in fact, it's designed to fail and to never give the people the protection that they deserve, which is designed in the Constitution that says you didn't even need to write SB4. You had Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3 that gave the states the rights to defend themselves. Why are we even creating this law that's out there? We don't need it. It's already in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is what the American people are asleep at because they don't know the document that protects them. They just simply don't know it. I, I encourage people to read it. It's only like, you know, a few pages. Well, I, I agree. And, and I have been reading it. I, I've been one of those people who maybe didn't pay as much attention as I should. And I'm using that word carefully. I should have paid more attention, but now I am. And yeah. and what's astonishing to me, so so I'm, I'm tracking very closely this uh, Missouri v. Biden case, right, which is around free speech. 
because what I love, you know, like I've, I've done all these deep dives into reading these latest things that have come out in say the uniform commercial code and bankruptcy law. And it's like gobbledygook and there are thousands of pages. The constitution is very clear. I like it because I can understand it. Right. Congress shall make no law abridging the right to free speech. Correct. There, got it. Very yep. easy. Yep. And then I'm watching these arguments in, in Katanji, the, the Supreme Court, like she's like all confused, like, well, I don't understand because the government does have rights to do. No, they don't. No, they don't. They don't. <laughs> they, they even tucked in the Ninth Amendment in case you missed it on the first pass, which was, oh, by the way, if we didn't give it to you specifically, not yours, government. Right. right. Not yours. Right. And 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 it's very clear. But she's confused. And 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 so people are analyzing the Supreme Court and like, oh, you know, this is a conservative. That's that. I said, no, no, no. It's very simple. They're going to vote five to four. And, oh, wouldn't you know it, the five are on the side of government being bigger and more powerful and the rights of the individuals being subsumed. Yeah. Kilo v. New London, Citizens United, on and on and on, all these things. They, but they give that appearance of, like, so close. I know. <laughs> five, four. It's a show. <laughs> it's a show. It's a sham. What it, a joke. You know, it's an information war, right? This is a massive information war. Uh, for everything we look at, when the people are constantly losing, it's designed to demoralize those of us that know that we're right. They know that we know that our rights are being trampled upon, but it's also designed to give us this feeling of we have nowhere to turn. Actually, we right. do. We have to turn to each other because there, I mean, for that silly euphemism, there are more of us than there are of them. It's true. There really are. And if we would just stop uh, from fighting behind our keyboards, I'm not saying put the keyboard down. I'm not saying mm -hmm. get off social media, but I mean, I'm talking literally say, you know what? I'm going to have to now dedicate a day of my life to meeting with my local members of my community to figure out how we can start to remove some of these people in our municipality, in our county, in our state that are literally having these fake fights for the sake of, you know, theater. And this is all political theater. They're profiting off problems. I call it con Inc. Because a lot of them are con so-called conservatives, right? That are out there talking about these cases, for instance, and arguing back and forth the merits of what, you know, Justice Brown said. There's no merit in what she said for the reasons you just stated, Chris. There's zero merit. But the fact of the matter is we don't know it because we don't know our Constitution. And it is in plain English for a simple reason. It's there for the plain people, not the, not the, not the, not, not the legal, uh, e legal eagles, not the attorneys. Mm -hmm. Um, we are the law sayers, and the law is in our Constitution. We say what's in there in plain English. These legal eagles, like you said, in their rules, codes, statutes, and ordinance, that is called stuff made up. Uh, put another four-letter word in there, but that's what it is, and it is for them. That is their legislative democracy in that 10 square miles, which is a federal corporation. It is a corporation. It is, by definition, in their own statutes, a corporation. You can look that up, too. So they have their. that's what governs corporations. The Constitution is to protect the people but stand on the law of the land. We're on the land. They're in their little corporate world, and that's fiction over there. It's, it's, you can't stand on a corporation, but you can stand on the land. And people need to start to understand the difference between the two. It's a bigger discussion, but when you break it down simply, uh, the people know that we win in the end if we just come together and we start to enforce the Constitution and we do it in mass in our communities. And if we do it in every single community in every single county, all 3,143 counties can rise together. We don't need a federal government. We don't need it. We only, we only started them, what, for 17, 18 uh, reasons, right? One of them was the post office and, and uh, our military to, and treasury to create money. But we don't need what they're doing. And they've created a lot of red tape with agencies of people that don't represent us because we didn't choose them. And we're supposed to follow their mandates. Well, mandates aren't the law and the law is in the Constitution. So the sooner people just stop paying attention to that, the lot better off we'll be. Now, um, I, I totally agree. And by the way, before I go further, uh, Anne, you mentioned people putting their head in the sand, so the ostriches and other people waking up. Where, 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 are, you, where are we on that from your perspective? Oof. You know, some days I feel like we're getting really close, and then other days I'm like, gosh, we just took a couple of steps back. Mm. Um, if I was to say on a percentage wise, I would say we're probably at about 30 to 40% awake. I mean, fully awake, like people see, can fully follow this conversation we're having. I think we're there. Mm -hmm. And I think, unfortunately, that's being diluted at a rapid rate because of the 46 million that the Customs and Border Protection will admit they know is in this country. I say the number is higher than that because a lot of at least, 
you know, uh, there, there's a lot of gotaways that they don't, you know, they just can't track. So I, I'd say we're probably at 30, maybe 40% awake and can follow this conversation and go, wow, maybe I should act on some of the things these two are talking about. Maybe I should look to organizations like Tactical Civics. Maybe I should look to my in my community and see who's doing what. Are people put it, coming together to protect us for food and self-defense? Uh, I just joined a co-op. My husband and I joined a co-op here. I'm more excited because we're coming together with like-minded people. But um, mm -hmm. I think we're looking at a catastrophe, uh, Chris, and it's going to be um, in our all in our own best interest to educate everybody and not just worry about what's happening in our under our roof, making sure we have food, et cetera, for ourselves, because the 60 percent of the people that aren't awake are going to be knocking on your door for food or barging in through the door, depending on where you live. So we have to do everything we can to help our fellow American out there, uh, up to and including these illegals that are here now to figure out who's really here for good reasons and who's not and coordinate with our law enforcement. That's what the second amendment's about a well-regulated militia. We need to organize. I agree. And you know, there's a, th this sense I have, most people don't know this, but these are the kinds of things that catch my eye when Biden and Harris were running their campaign back. Um, you know, what was that? 2020, Mm -hmm. The official name of their URL was buildbackbetter.gov, not bidenharris.gov, buildbackbetter.gov. Like, well, that's a UN catchphrase, you know, that's all yeah. about this new future, this utopia they want to build towards. And the more I've thought about it, like, like that should have been the tip off right there that should have alarmed me more than it did. Looking back, I'm like, oh, there it is, because they do these things in plain sight. This is part right. of their, their M method of operations, right? Their MO. And I look at that, I'm like, well, to build back my house, I think it kind of has to burn down first. So my mm -hmm. sense of these people is they're professional destroyers. They're evil and they want to burn everything down because once they do, they can rebuild in this better utopia. And so his history says, not only am I going to be disappointed if they get their way, but they will too. And I think they're too dumb to know that they think they're going to burn it all down and somehow remain in power. I think they're going to kill the golden goose that laid the golden egg and destroy things in a way that will be very difficult to recover from. And we may never, if they do it a, a good enough job. Well, that's what the fight is for me at this stage, right? What's it is. Does that resonate? Is that it totally resonates? It totally resonates for me. And, and again, going back to they hate God, you know, Satan's always going to tell you what he's going to do. You know, the devil will always be in the details. And there is a very big detail that you said it didn't resonate with you in the beginning. But looking back now, it does build back better a U.N. statement, a U.N. propaganda piece that you've heard everybody from King Charles on down the road uh, that are all signed into the World Economic Forum's agenda, which I call the WEF, the unofficial State Department for the United Nations. Uh, and the WHO is their militarized arm. But uh, again, the, the prescription here is do you want to live in the image of our creator? Do you want to live in a, in a world that is free? And America has always been that, that separatist movement, I suppose you could call it, that really mm -hmm. embraced what God intended for us to be, which is free. And that's why we were so sought after for, for, for over 100 years by people from around the world that wanted to live here, and they would do anything to come lawfully and work their way. It took 10, 12 years to get their green card and their residency and hopefully become a U.S. citizen. That was the dream, right? Now that dream has been weaponized against the people that are here lawfully by the people that are anti-God that want to destroy freedom because they want to control everything. So their image of building back better is destroying everything that man has created over thousands of years so that they can, you know, decide whether we should be breathing, you know, how much CO2 in our atmosphere, how much Monsanto on our food and so on and so forth. And, and if whether or not you should be human. And should they change your DNA? I mean, this is the this is the conversations that they're having in the open that started behind closed doors. But the plan that we're seeing a build back better includes everything we've just discussed in this podcast. And again, and again, there's other other tentacles to this madness. But this is the agenda of 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 the United Nations and the World Economic Forum. This is their global elite agenda, and uh, it saddens me to think that people can't step back uh, for five minutes and contemplate any of these things and ask the question, well, why is this happening now? Why did they pass this? Why is the Supreme mm -hmm. Court? People aren't asking the question why and trying to look at the dominoes that fell before the one that just fell in front of them at that moment and try to understand the chain of events that got them here. When you start to look at things through a chain of events, 
and through a certain lens and a prism, you can actually start to see things more crystally clear. But I just don't see enough people around the world doing it. They're revolting because they are having their farms taken away. And I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Thank God they're standing up and fighting back in countries around the world over that. My God, they're taking farms and shutting farms down in Oregon now over water rights. Um, so mm -hmm. if people don't understand why and just say, well, I got to fight them over my water rights. No, 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 no. Why are they going after you and your farm? What is, and why is water just an excuse? Um, it, it, people just need to stop for five minutes. And I'm afraid it's going to, it's going to cause the sacrifice, uh, that people need to make similar to what our revolutionary fathers did. They sacrificed everything, right? To get freedom here. But people need to stop and decide whether or not they're willing to make that sacrifice for not only their families, but for humanity, because if humanity is to survive, we're going to have to be free. We cannot survive what they have planned for us because they've made it evidently clear by their actions, um, everything that they've done so far to this point, including the Georgia Guidestones, which enumerated it in, I think, 12 languages chiseled in stone before it collapsed one day in an odd circumstance, Collapse. right? <laughs> um, they told us that we should only have 500 million people on the planet. And by all intents and purposes, the, the chain of events that we're seeing unfold in the world today, we're going to get there if we allow it to continue. We're going to get there. Well, this is part of, we got to square the circle up then because as you started earlier, you said, oh, part of their mythology is that there's this replacement theory for Western societies, which don't have quite the birth rate that they need, a whole separate discussion of why people aren't having babies, but they aren't. So right. we're going to bring these people in to, to begin demographically supporting the pyramid and at the same time you go over to the wf website or the georgia guidestones they tell you straight up why they're doing what they're doing they say by 2050 we're going to need three planets of resources they say it it's right on their website we don't have three planets of resources what do you do well right. fewer resources per person now we're talking about 15 minute cities and universal basic you know throttled income or fewer people those are your right. only options so you can't square this idea of saying oh we're going to help you know, distribute the population around the world because there's too few people over here. Plus, we need less people. Um, that doesn't make sense. What does make sense is that them moving these people is part of their larger plan to how we get their ultimate goal, which is how do we get back to 500 million people? That That's what they're doing. Yeah. So if that's the why, you entered something important, which is the why now. Do you have the sense that we're we're sort of in the end times in a sense, like there's like a lot of plans are coming together now over these next few years? It certainly does feel that way uh, with, you know, the, re the Fed move recently, right, to limit the amount of money or any money at all going into banks now. So we're seeing that move on March 11th. That was a big deal. And when they approached the, you know, when they had a meeting with Congress, right, the head of Bank of America, Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan, Jamie Dimon said, well, we can't move from zero percent reserves. Imagine that zero reserves for every dollar that's put into a bank. Zero. Right. They've just loaned it all out, spent it, whatever. It's gone. They couldn't move to even 3%, $3 for every 100 that deposit. It's insane to think that, right? This is not fractional reserve currency. That is just bankruptcy. Okay, let's call it what mm -hmm. it is. They couldn't do that. So we know the banking system is going to go through another round of collapses like we did this time last year with, uh, you know, um, what was the uh, SVB Silicon Valley? And yeah, Silicon, Silicon Valley. Yeah. Yes, SVB and Silicon Valley. Thank you. So that's already in motion. We can see that coming. They want CBDC. Again, about track, trace, and control. Bill Gates has put it out there on YouTube. We can use vaccines to control populations. Um, and I think the word was reduce populations. Um, so this is all out there. This, these are their words. I mean, we, we don't have to fact check this, or we should, but it's their words. He did that in the TED Talk for people that want to look it up. Um, they talk out of both sides of their mouths, right? Because they've got to use the feel-good language. They've got to create the, the, the semblance that we all these poor people, we should take them in and help them. We're such a rich country. Well, we're slowly and not slowly, we're quickly becoming a third world country. I've driven around it. Look at the infrastructure. It tells you all you need to do with your own eyes. We're collapsing, literally physically collapsing. Um, the mm -hmm. banks won't be able to support it. The, the, the money isn't going to be there for these people. And the replacement population is they're replacing you and me. Uh, and they're replacing them with people who are literally going to be useful idiots because through artificial intelligence, you know, they can replace news anchors and just generate news with their own Muppets. It, it's very simple to do. They're doing it now. We're seeing it happen, right? The parrots are saying the same thing in the teleprompters en masse all over the United States. It's very obvious what they're doing here. Uh, they're showing us again. But again, those same people that are replacing us in the menial jobs eventually you're going to be useful idiots and will be exterminated by the fact that there won't be food and there won't be money. So 
in order to sort, sort of, I guess, keep us, the majority of the people in the country and around the world feeling like we're doing the best thing for humanity, we're basically building our gallows and lighting ourselves on fire at the same time. And it's just, it's a matter of a fuse and, and what goes first. I don't know what the, we have the table events, you know, the, the, um, it, the table has been set with all the different catalysts that could go up spontaneously and create a chain of events. I don't know what it is or when it's going to be, but I do know we have an election this year. And the last thing they want to see a Donald Trump get reelected unless of course, unless of course, getting him in the office calms the majority of the MAGA crowd down enough to go, Oh, our savior's back. We can sit back and relax. He'll take care of it. Again, that's, that's delegating authority to one man when in fact we the people are the government and we the people ever now ever more ever more need to be more vigilant and we need to be helping save our country and one man can't do it because he doesn't have Congress. They're not going to give him Congress. And look at the judicial branch. It's proven to be wrought with people who are anti-constitution. So we, this is a very dangerous time for the world, in fact, Chris. It's not just America, but they're looking to America to go, well, you were always our last hope of freedom. Can you guys save us? And I say back, you all have problems in your own country. Stop importing them here. Stop being lured to come here for freedom when clearly you can see we're on we're in, two feet in the grave. So stay home, fix your own problems, and everybody needs to put their you know put their big boy pants on and go to work. This is it's us versus the elites. It's humanity versus the elites, and I say humanity can win. We just need to see it for what it is, and um, get to work. Now, I agree this is probably an unpopular opinion. The president can be constructive or additive in a certain way, but but can't solve this. It's not possible. Right. And, uh, and, and so I think, actually, that the way the presidency is whooped up in people's minds and all this press and all that stuff, it's a psyop because it's meant to d mislead us into the idea that it matters. It doesn't really matter. I'm old enough to have seen no daylight in, in things that matter between presidents left, right, left, right, Republican, nothing changed, right? We went right. from Bush to Obama and Obama inherited the most target rich environment for the biggest financial fraud and theft that had ever happened, the great financial crisis. And nothing happened. Nobody went to jail. More public money was used to bail out the people who committed the crimes. Uh, it was just, it was a, insane, right? Wars, the things I care about. I, you know, when I take a, like if you land at JFK and take a cab in, you better hope you get a, a, a cab with a good set of shocks on it. You know, it's just an awful third world adventure. Potholes, dropped cell phone connections. It's just a mess, right? Correct. That's what I care about. I care about uh, fixing our country back up. I care about living in peace and freedom. I care about using our resources for our own prosperity. I care about not sending my tax dollars to go kill people in other countries. That's what I care about. There's nobody representing those cares anymore. Nobody. No, we've been completely overtaken by the globalist, you know, corporate mindset, this public private partnership of evil, I call it. Uh, you mm -hmm. look at, you know, going back into, I mean, my goodness, we could go back, let's just go back into uh, 9 11, right? What have we learned about 9 11? Well, the, the uh, Department of Defense had $2.3 trillion they couldn't account for. They failed every audit ever since. And, uh, it's the military industrial complex that is getting the taxpayer money that the Federal Reserve is printing and we're paying interest on. Unsustainable at that at this point, as you know, 34 trillion plus in debt. Can't even make interest payments anymore. It's ridiculous. But, you know, everything that we now know has been basically a fraud on the American taxpayer, the American people, including the 16th Amendment, which is a fraudulent amendment because, you know, you can't tax labor. And in fact, I challenge anybody to look up in the IRS code to figure out where they can actually say they can tax people's labor. You can't. It's really for people who reside in District of Columbia, that 10 square miles. That's a U.S. taxpayer, not the people like you and I that live outside that 10 square miles. We don't work for the government. So, you know, this has just been smoke and mirrors from day one. And really, to your point, what do I want to see? I want to restore our republic. I want to get back to the basics where the Constitution is the law of the land and we the people have that document to protect us from the public servants that are supposed to be representing us. Right now we have corporations everywhere that are running us, starting with Washington, D.C., and it, and all of their sub-corporations with their all capital states of Texas, state of Florida, state of California, and all caps names. We need to get away from that and we need to restore the republic where those states are independent nation states as we were. We were a union of states. America was founded on liberty, the pursuit of happiness, 
and of course, God-given life here, right, and our Bill of Rights. And it, was, it all changed in 1868 after the Civil War. And we can talk about all the wars that happened between the Revolutionary War and 1868, but I can assure you the facts lead you that it was all the British crown coming back, trying to take back America, their crown jewel. And in 1868, they figured out how they could do it in a peaceful way by making us all U.S. citizens and, and passing the 14th Amendment, which, by the way, was fought tooth and nail for two years by the states. They didn't want to give up their state's individuality as the state of Virginia or New York. They wanted to stay individual nation states that came together as a union, created this little federal government to, for the common defense of man and post offices and make printing money to you know, you know, harbor the treasury there. But that was it. It was never to be what it is today with all these agencies that are, again, for-profit corporations, Department of Defense, Secretary you know, the Department of Education, Energy, and CDC, FDA, NIH. All those are for-profit corporations that are employing people that came from public sectors and, and excuse me, private sector in the, in the corporate business, in the military, in the pharmaceutical, have stock in those companies, are now working for agencies that dictate policy and who gets, who gets money spent back in their stock-held companies. This is not America. We need to get rid of all of that. I want to restore the simplicity that when you get up in the morning, you're not in fear of your government. People live in fear of their government today. Government should be fearing us. That's how it's supposed to work. Uh, when, when your representative will tell you that because he's a congressman, he's federal, and he's on top, we've got a problem. And I heard that from the horse's mouth from Congressman Morgan Luttrell in Texas. This is the mentality that we're dealing with in D.C. We've lost complete yoke of the reins here, and we've got to rein it all back in. So I want to restore that republic. I want people to be free. I want people to feel safe and secure in their, in their person's property and papers and their homes. And I don't want them to fear the government anymore. In fact, all of humanity should have that same blueprint. We should export the charters that we have of our own freedoms to the rest of humanity, and they should be able to use it so that God's men and women around the world can all live like we should be living here in America. And that's the fundamental thrust of what I do, how I look at everything, Chris, and why Operation Burning Edge is so near and dear to my heart. Because, again, it's about humanity being um, basically uh, abused and uh, they're being forced into a migration that ordinarily would not happen, except the conditions in their own country are bad. And we can talk about who set conditions in their own country, including our own CIA that's done a great job of color revolutions around the world. Haiti, for instance, I think that smells of a CIA operation. Uh, timing is really interesting that it happens now, that there's a mass Haitian migration. In fact, when you and I were just connecting, I was talking with a journalist who I can't give the name away, but we've got 2,000 Haitians in Tapachula, Mexico, getting ready to come into the States. So it's just, you know, this is weaponized migration, and it's, it's everything that is anti-God, anti anti-human rights, and anti-freedom as you can possibly paint a picture of, but they're doing it. And that's what I'm fighting for, to restore the exact well, opposite you. of what they intend. That's brilliantly said. I, I agree with all of that. It's really the collectivists against the individualists. But what's yeah. astonishing to me, Anne, is, is seeing, like, I was just, I was really astonished, this poor German legislator was just aghast, could barely make the words form in her mouth because she just found out that, you know, a, a colonel way down the food chain was openly talking on that recorded Zoom conversation or whatever it was, uh, um, I think it was a uh, Microsoft meetings. Anyway, unsecure line about how they were going to ship their tornado missiles into Ukraine and give them training on it. This is basically World War Three, and her position was, hey, can we talk about this before we do things that could initiate a thermonuclear war? Like, they're not even talking about it. They're just plowing ahead with these idiot ideas because uh they're evil i guess i don't know i just I, it's not just our own country that's lost it's, it's is something is this just late stage empire is this is this how it felt in rome right around nero's time you know the things <laughs> just kind of kind of go off the tracks you know camille Paglia says the end stage is always debauchery and decadence you know and is i'm just wondering like is this a normal pattern of humanity or something hmm. special well, you know, the Roman Empire fell eventually, right? And it was fraught with debauchery and transsexuals and, and you know, sex orgies, violence, of course. And it seems that, you know, the republics don't usually last more than 250 years. Well, we're at our expiration date if you just go by that rule of thumb alone. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm an optimist and I believe in God. I don't believe God is going to allow his children to disintegrate into total debauchery. Yes, there is the wheat and the chaff. And we, I do believe we're in Matthew 
uh, 24. I believe we're in end times. I do, but I don't believe it's just going to end in this fiery ball of flames because even the madmen on the other side who are the bankers who I believe are financing both sides of the war to support their depopulation agenda and control of humanity and one world government and mass migration, etc. They know they need the resources on this planet. So bombing countries out of existence and mutually assured destruction with thermonuclear war, even for those guys, I don't think makes a heck of a lot of sense. They need the resources. And so I don't believe we're going to end like that. I do believe we're going to see uh, through this mass weaponized human migration, you're going to see maybe even the United States break apart. I hope not. I hope we don't. But look at the demographics living in the West Coast versus living in the middle of the country and in some select states. Florida is unfortunately going by the way of Texas if this mass migration continues. But I think you're going to see people divide based on the collectivist mentality and the you know, individual freedom, you know, rights of the people's mentality. Uh, I think it's going to be a protracted period of time. And I think we're going to have to sustain some very difficult times ahead. Uh, and I hope humanity survives, to be honest. I think we could, we're on that verge of a massive population extinction event because of famine. And Michael Yan is an expert on that. And he's talked about it on numerous podcasts. But I think we can also manage that if we can do our job as government saying, I got to talk to my neighbors, go, hey, do you really understand what's happening here? And talk to my other neighbor and same thing and get together in my HOA. We need to show that sort of leadership at this point now and be like, just putting this out there, guys. But here's what you should be thinking about. And here's what I'm doing, but I can't feed everybody. So if we run into problems while I'm telling you I'm doing it, I'm not telling you where I'm keeping it because I don't trust anybody when it gets crazy. And that's unfortunately where we have to be. And you have to sort of put that into people's consciousness to get them to think about it. Because at the end of the day, nobody comes and pours my coffee for me or you know puts my clothes on. I do it myself. And it's that yeah. fundamental. And we got to be responsible. God gave us a brain, right, Chris? He wants us to think. So let's think. Let's think. I have been ever since uh, Panama. Panama changed a lot of things. And I had discussions with Matt. And then I talked about the cross that's on your neck. And I've been reading the Bible for the first time, really, in my life. Uh, I grew up wasp, which was, you know church was christmas and easter that was right. that was my whole thing right hey, it was sunday I, I school i subscribed to that whole that whole thing by the way that was my life <laughs> until was it? until okay. recently oh yeah I've, so i'm I've reading i'm it. reading now you know and i'm like oh humans have been here before we've been here before we've been here before yes. right so so this happens and it happens because we we lose the basic instruction set which is uh, how to how to be with each other and i i've seen this so now i'm reading this story over and over again it's a little hair raising to see so many things that I see today are just, just listen, this is a human instruction and set on one level and people have been here. So they wrote it down. Thanks. When I look at this, I realize that if I could, and I would grab people by the lapel and I would shake them and I would say, you're at a bifurcation point and you're being asked to choose. And are right. you going to choose the light or are you going to choose the dark? Because I right. really think this is for all the marbles. There's only one marble that matters and that's your soul. That's how I see this now. And I see yes. people actively choosing the darkness, right? That's fine. They've made their choice. They get yeah. to live with that. But it's open, right? We see this now with uh, all the occult symbology and there's these little Satanist things. And like, it's just everywhere. Now, once you see it, at least maybe I'm late to the game. But once I saw it, I'm like, oh, there it is. There it is. There it is. There are people who've openly declared one direction. And what you're saying is there's a, a, a growing group of people who need to come together and are coming together because it's time to pick. It's like, pick your team. <laughs> right. That's we're kind of yeah. at that stage of things. Yeah. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with building the ark. That's why I joined a co-op and this co-op has mm -hmm. got, you know, they, they're what a great group, by the way, importing wheat and bulgur from Turkey, because why? Cause they don't spray it with GMO and not, and, and Monsanto and, you know, all, it, this isn't this is what it's about it's finding like-minded people coming together and making sure you have food to feed your families um it and it's it's about planning for your future when you work at corporation x and let's say they have a nice 401k and employee stock purchase program and you donate 10 percent of your salary every paycheck to that you are in fact planning for your future what you may not realize is thanks to dodd frank uh, they can, the banks can bail in, they can take your money and also <laughs> wait for it. They can take your 401k because it's a government, uh, organized tax scheme to save you from paying taxes in the future. So therefore 
that is not even your money at this point. So that future that you think you're planning for, the government can swipe that fast with a with a you know a, a blip on a ledger screen. It's really not difficult for them to do. And believe me, with the debt we're in, they're going to do it. They have no choice. So I agree with you, Chris. We are at that bifurcation point in history. Dark, light. Um, God gave you discernment. You can use it. And if you choose the dark, that's fine. Um, I feel that um, I'm going to continue to do the work I do to help educate people. You can always decide to choose light, but that's up to you. But I also know, and you now know, having read the Bible, and I don't know how many times you've gone through it, you know in the end, not everybody gets to go because of the choices that they make. And so, you know, you can look at all the evidence in front of you and make your choice. And uh, I will forevermore be pleased the one I've made. And I've now released myself from the guilt of knowing that I can't save everybody. And that includes family members, Chris, and friends I've had for mm -hmm. years. I've had to let that go. It took me... It took me till recently mm. to be able to go, okay, I'm not suffering from that anymore. I, I don't suffer at all. I don't even lose sleep over it anymore because I understand what the mission is here. And I understand where I am with my relationship with God. And I am I can sleep at night now. I'll pray for those people and I will continue to. But, you know, we've got to move on because this is what God would expect us to do. It's called his children have to keep moving forward. He created us and that's that. That's the way it goes. Chop, chop. I totally agree. Well, Ann, thank you so much for your time today. We're going to continue this at some point. Uh, how do people follow you best in this best world? Best would be on X, formerly known as Twitter, um, at hmm. Ann Vandersteel on X. And I have links to my Rumble channel there, uh, my Substack. I've got annvandersteel.substack.com. So feel free to follow me in those places. Eventually, I'm going to get around to finishing my website. I haven't done that yet. I've just been too busy doing things. Um, we're going to stand up a, a burning edge website as well so that people can follow the work of what we're doing. And of course, your stuff will be featured there as well with your permission. So of course, permission granted. Thank so you. Thank you so much for your time today and Godspeed. Good luck with everything. And to you as well, Chris.